So thank you very much, Sandeep. And I'm excited to um, welcome Ruth Marinshaw and William Law, both from the Stanford Research Computing Center. Um, and, um, you know, we in Research IT um, like to work with Ruth's folks and we're planning actually a meetup. Um, and so this is actually nice that we uh, can do it here instead of an in-person meetup. Um, so welcome Ruth and William. Thank you, Amy and Jason. And I can't see myself. Oh, yes, I can. Okay, so now you can see me, but I'm actually gonna say very little and I'm not gonna be contributing too much to this because what we want to focus on today from the Stanford perspective is a specific technology that we have used and are using both on-premise and in cloud to provide a common baseline and a common framework to deliver research computing services to our researchers in this instance, specifically focused on high-risk data from the Stanford perspective. For us, most of these data are PHI. Um, it's great to hear Sandeep and indeed Valerie Mayason from our team, who is also on the call. And I talked with Sandeep last week about specific compliance aspects of his environment as we might think about deploying those here, but that's not the focus of this talk. It's really about Kubernetes and the person who's gonna present here is William Law. He is from Team Research Computing at Stanford as Amy referenced. We have a very good and close and continuing relationship with Research Computing at Berkeley. I'm Patrick Schmitz who's on the line and his team, many of his former team, many of whom are on the call. And we uh, made a point or a pact, and we haven't been as faithful as we intended to, but mostly we try to get together in person twice a year to compare notes, do sort of an unneeding, what are you doing? What are we doing? How can we share information and learn from each other? And so it's great to have this virtual opportunity to extend those collaborations and interactions and information sharing with a much broader community in, in this context. So Will is our uh, technical lead for platforms and cloud services and research computing. Many of Team Nero, Nero is our high risk uh, cloud environment, are on the line, um, Addis O'Connor and Neil Soderquist and Valerie Maison, whom I referenced before, as well as others from Research Computing who have some aspect of cloud technologies in their portfolio. So we're delighted to take questions online or after the fact or after the meeting, um, however it works out, but I will turn it over to Will now and um, Amy, Jason, Bill and others, thank you for the opportunity to share the information and we look forward to uh, learning from you guys how we can do things differently or better. Will? Yeah, um, thank you, Ruth. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, really just try Kubernetes in general for research. Um, it's really lessons learned from Nero uh, I didn't realize up front that I was going to be speaking to so many of our friends from Berkeley Research IT. Uh, we are Stanford Research Computing. We support work across disciplines of, with, for computational research. So we really support everything we can across the university and support a very, very broad set of workloads. Um, Stanford has a great online archive. This was the kind of funniest retro computing picture I could find. So it's, you know, folks computing at Stanford and we really want to support researchers across all the disciplines. Uh, Nero has been pretty focused on health because uh, of its orientation for high risk data. So there'll be some small references to that, but mostly I'm going to focus on Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, first, the name Nero, it, Nero is named after Nero Wolf, uh, the detective created by Rex Stout. Um, and the big thing to remember, I guess, is uh, Nero Wolf sits in his mansion thinking through everything. 
he doesn't really like to travel or, or move around. And when you think about a platform for, for secure data, that's really what you want, right? And so Nero is a platform uh, for supporting work uh, in a secure manner. And, uh, but not everybody thinks of uh, Nero the Emperor, so we always kind of have to explain that. <laughs> um, when we start talking about uh, the platform or what we want to, the platform to look like with our partners uh, in the School of Medicine, it seemed like we really wanted to leverage containers. Um, the big benefit of containers, I think, is that you get a uh, known and reproducible quantity for your runtime. So there's a, a really good build system. So you have a documented build for the workload, and then you have a portable result. And when we think about uh, supporting lots of different work and hopefully adding in, uh, initially we started, this is the first system really, we started thinking about having components be both on-premise and in the cloud. We really needed a way to ensure consistency and, and portability of runtime. Um, it wasn't clear which container technology we would use, right? There are many, many different choices, many different uh, even concepts, but it was something we, we hoped we could do to provide consistency for the environment. Um, the other key portion was supporting clouds. Right now, we're on running on premise, and we have a long history of running, you know, large high performance computing systems on premise. Uh, but we really just had our foot uh, on the edge of the pool of clouds, uh, and so we needed a way to provide consistent, uh, reproducible environments for clouds. So part of that's containers. Uh, and but we needed a way to be able to expand to other clouds just besides one or two uh that i think has been really really uh interesting to see uh especially i think with the covid 19 stuff in that uh, folks want to use all sorts of things there are tons of researchers who are getting credits from many, many different cloud providers. And so we will truly be operating definitely in the, all three major providers and probably even smaller ones because of uh, leveraging technology. And so we needed to think of a way to provide a consistent compute framework across different cloud vendors. The technology we went with uh, is Kubernetes. I think at the time it wasn't clear how things would be and if Kubernetes would take off. Uh, it's actually turned into a very successful platform. Um, oftentimes folks just start talking about Kubernetes and I think it's good to level set about what Kubernetes is. Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform uh, and really it's been designed to build services. So, uh, that orientation is for creating plumbing between containers and container life cycles and networking and storage and really controlling connectivity internal to the system and then connectivity to the outside. Uh, and it's deeply, uh, it's, it's very web oriented, I guess, uh, which is the way many workloads are, but uh, it's not, well, it just has a very different mindset, I guess, from uh, high performance computing systems. And so it's, it's definitely been interesting to, to learn about and to leverage, but we've created a, a very successful platform off of it. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, one of the key things that I think differentiates 
Kubernetes from many platforms. In IT, something that's very important, and, and people have actually alluded to different ways today, is thinking about the life cycle of workloads and of runtimes. Uh, Kubernetes actually incorporates the concept of container life cycle. So you have the capability to run and control operations uh, when things start up and when they shut down. Uh, a lot of times when folks are just thinking about VMs or uh, conventional computing, they're not thinking of the whole runtime life cycle. And so this provides us a way to control this. And so one of the things, uh, like an example of a workload uh, on this is just a simple database, right? When, when databases start up, you run a post start check to make sure the database is consistent. Uh, when we shut down or restart the database, uh, we, we just initiate the shutdown command. Uh, this, that seems pretty rudimentary, but uh, when folks started with containers, they would just like run the containers and then there wasn't any sort of life cycle sense, right? And so Kubernetes incorporates all of this into the platform from uh, the start up to the death and then even cleanup of operations. Uh, the other key thing, especially for working with secure data, is connectivity. Uh, Kubernetes, a core API component is a network policy. It's pluggable and lets us coordinate con connections between different containers. Uh, and you actually do that via labels. So it makes the management of uh, the policy much easier uh, because we can create labels and allow specific levels of connectivity between our systems or between our pods, excuse me. So uh, it's very, very uh, extensible and very easy to use. The other uh, nice portion is there's an idea of ingress into the cluster. So we have a reproducible way to control uh, ingress to the system and egress to the system. So not only can we control the internal traffic, uh, but we can control external traffic. And uh, one of the things that uh, was mentioned in the Sherlock talk in the slides was uh, web application firewalls. We could easily implement, insert those into uh, the system and have very controlled access. Uh, so our current Kubernetes deployments, we really have two uh, categories. Uh, there's our on-premise system that's using the charm distribution of Kubernetes and our current cloud deployments that are based around Google Kubernetes engine. Uh, in the near future, we uh, plan to leverage other vendors, Kubernetes implementations. Uh, Amazon, of course, will be first. <laughs> uh, and I think Azure will be fairly soon. Uh, one of the key things I wanted to bring up with Berkeley, uh, Jupyter, is huge and it's been a key component of the platform. We're leveraging Jupyter Hub and are huge fans of Jupyter's Kuba spawner. Uh, we've extended it and since uh, incorporated further uh, improvements to it to uh, spawn uh, user notebooks with specific user constrained user IDs in Kubernetes. Uh, so the system uh, has very tight security parameters. It's, it's been really good. Uh, the other thing we're loading, running on top of Kubernetes is uh, Slurm, uh, the high performance scheduler. The reason we're running it is because our users are very familiar with the way Slurm behaves and it provides a conventional HPC environment. Uh, I think in the longer term, we may just use uh, Kubernetes components to, to do scheduling. Uh, but initially, we were nervous about the security profile of uh, giving users access to Kubernetes. And so right now, the only interface for running jobs for users is Slurm, which we're, ve we're very familiar with. Um, one of the key things uh, is dynamism in the cloud. We need to be able to both start things and stop things. We want everything to be uh, expandable, but um, 
elastic, right? And uh, so Jupiter and Slurm both allow us to dynamically start and stop uh, workloads in the cloud without users have to, having to do anything. They just log in. In the case of Jupyter Hub, they literally just log on and it will start up new nodes for them. And with Slurm, um, the nodes are started as users submit jobs. Um, and the key thing is resources shut down when users aren't running, using them, and uh, it helps control costs. Um, <clears throat> so challenges. I, I think we've always, uh, one of the, it's always useful to reflect on challenges of platforms. Uh, one of the big things of running Kubernetes that's been challenging is the rate of change. Uh, they update Kubernetes every quarter. So the release is really, really rapid. Uh, the platform that we've been running has started out at Kubernetes 1.13, and we currently have Kubernetes 1.18 in place. Uh, it's interesting, the cloud providers mostly are a little slower on Kubernetes updates. Uh, GKE right now has just started shipping Kubernetes 1.16. Uh, they're usually about two releases behind. Um, and, and so that's been uh, something to get used to. We've actually done a pretty good job of keeping up with all the updates. Uh, one of the challenges with the platform in particular is uh, the APIs keep on improving. Uh, just recently, they went through a large uh, period of, or it was really just one release on 1.8.16, they deprecated or they removed a number of APIs that had been deprecated for a while. And that is kind of an inflection point in the system because uh, APIs that were available aren't available anymore. It's very different from what Amazon does where the APIs kind of exist forever. Uh, I think with everything we do, user experience is very, very important and very important for us to be mindful of. Uh, there's an expectation, especially with everything in the cloud, that everything happens instantly. And anytime you can't do that, users are a little dissatisfied. I blame Google for that, right? If you go to search and find something right away, that's what everyone's been accustomed to. Uh, and everything that doesn't do that is a little bit of a letdown. <laughs> Folks expect instances to start up immediately and their computing to start up immediately. And so there's always a little bit of work left for us to do. Once we get to that point, you know, we'll be golden, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's a ways away. Um, I think cost modeling is a challenge because uh, there are always new cloud products folks want to leverage. Um, and understanding folks' workloads, especially with folks who are new to really cloud computing, but we've been working with a lot of folks who are new to computing at scale. And so that can be a challenge to work with and, and sort out. Um, and, and especially the cost models of depending on what we're choosing to use. And then um, if we're using, Kubernetes works really well for generic compute uh, portability across systems, but it doesn't cover everything. And there's a growing emphasis, it's not extremely new, for using cloud-based APIs. There's some interesting work going on around, or going along using the, uh, the idea of a virtual kubelet, where you can use Kubernetes to map uh, to arbitrary APIs. And then we'll work for some sorts of things. Uh, so we could use that uh, to provide a generic interface to, to some services, particularly cloud functions. Uh, however, there, many of the cloud providers are offering very special, great services that we need to be, be able to provide for our users. So that's something we're, we're still trying to, to figure out how to do. Um, and with that, um, I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, William. I think we can take a couple of questions for William and Sandeep. Sandeep, thanks for answering questions in the chat as well. No problem. Any 
any questions about Kubernetes? I saw you all on the poll earlier said you wanted to hear more about Kubernetes. So here you go. Hi, Bill. This is Tim from UC Berkeley. I was wondering if you were to redo this again, let's say you were starting a project new today, would you have done certain things differently? I think the, the big thing I would, have, would do differently or would have done differently, uh, we started the on-prem system first. Mm -hmm. And that was the wrong order of operations because we should really should have really started it in a cloud because you don't have to spin up as much infrastructure <laughs> uh we had a pretty high bar to get started in that we had to have you know storage and compute before we could even get the kubernetes cluster started right so it just uh we started on the deeper end of everything the flip side is when we went to the cloud portion, uh, it was very relative, relatively easy just to get started. You know, you went, you can create right. multiple Kubernetes clusters very quickly uh, with a single rather complicated command. <laughs> and that was really great. Great, thank you. Yeah. I will uh, say hi, outside Will. Kubernetes, um, we, as Will mentioned, we support a wide array of research and we tailor our services to meet what researchers need rather than giving them offerings and asking them to, we try to avoid having them think differently about their problems in order to fit into our solution. So while Kubernetes is a common underlying architectural principle, whether on-prem or in the cloud, and there are templates and sort of standard base environments, there is constant change and customization because of course, every PI is going to save the world and is the most important and is, um, is, is unique. And I learned on CNN the other day, we can say they're very unique. You can actually say something is very unique, which I don't think makes any sense at all. But each one of these PIs is very unique. And so we do what we can, um, add us, Neil, Will, Valerie, to customize and add new features still within a, a framework that is auditable, secure, and meets um, meets compliance requirements, but still is customized in many ways. Any other questions for William before we wrap up? There are some questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to go through them, but it might be faster for me just to speak. Yep. Um, so Anthony asked, is there a vision for campus-wide Kubernetes solution that incorporates also education and administrative services? <laughs> the short answer is not at this time. There, uh, one of the things that's been, but uh, one of the things that's been interesting is we've had folks come to us with uh, Kubernetes-based workloads that they want to run. And so, uh, we're trying to think about how to support that. Uh, one of the big places that's already doing that sort of work is the Nautilus project uh, that will be spoken about, it sounds like next time or soon. Uh, so that's definitely of strong interest to me. Probably what we would do in, in a, something like this would be set up uh, pod security policies to control what UIDs users could run as and uh, give them specific namespaces to run in. Uh, so that's something that we're thinking about, uh, but aren't ready to do right now. 